All right, so welcome on board in 14 Day Pilot Flight Academy. We're going to talk about <clears throat> the art of instrument flying, okay? The in instrument flight rules. This is the new level of um, any aviators who wants to pursue their career in the operator, like airline, charter, or anything. Even if you want to get your type rating, you have to have an instrument rating. Some pilots, they can go for the type rating, let's say so you go for 737 or A320, but without instrument rating on your pilot certificate, there will be a limitation, which is you fly the jet or you fly the Boeing or Airbus with only um, VFR. So nobody wants to do that. And most of the time when you fly the bigger airplane like jets, 70% uh, of your flying part, you will be looking inside, right? So instrument rating is the only way to improve your skill. So if people think that becoming commercial pilot, I can become a better pilot in terms of skills, but in, uh, in fact, if you already instrument rating pilot, right, you, 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 you pass the check right, and let's say you fly 30 hours, 50 hours as instrument rating pilot, I believe there will be a huge improvement on your piloting skills. Because uh, in the private pilot level, we know there's limitation like 100 feet for altitude and plus minus 10 for the headings and speed as well, like 10 knots, um, maximum deviation from the appointed uh, numbers. That same in instrument rating pilot, if you are a private pilot instrument rating, then the examiner will look at your piloting skill, whether you can hold at that kind of margin, right? 100 foot on the altitude and 10 knots on the heading, uh, so 10 knots on the airspeed and 10 degrees of the heading. Once you come to the commercial level, the commercials want you to maintain at least 50 feet for the altitude. So even though the ACS, the certification standard saying that you have to maintain the altitude minus zero plus hundred, you know, in, in instrument rating pilot, you really have to maintain the altitude uh, minus zero plus hundred because you you never want to go below the minimum altitude. That's that's the key point of instrument rating because you cannot uh, see anything and you want to be clear from any obstacle. So it means you cannot go lower than the minimum altitude. Then yes, in a commercial pilot there will be a tighter limitation on the on the altitude deviation or anything. But to make you a better pilot, instrument rating is a must. So I always talk to my students when they get a private. Uh, I really hope you're coming back for your instrument rating because only way, the only way to make you a better, have a better hands to fly, a better focus, like workload management and the task management, and of course the multitasking management, the instrument rating will give you a huge benefit. Okay, and you will learn like the first, the first time you fly instrument. There will be a lot of stress, I can guarantee you. You fly under the hood, even though you are using puggle or a hood like that, doesn't matter. Then at the same time, you have to do a cockpit management. There will be a tons of papers, the chart, approach charts, right? And then also the clearances is different. 
In interim rating, especially in the United States, FAA give you a damn a lot of a very long clearance. Let's say if, uh, from Los Angeles, you're based in Van Nuys and you want to fly to San Jose or you fly to St. Ana and uh, the class Charlie Airport, maybe like Santa Barbara, there will be a lot of clearances that you have to be familiar and you put a note on that. So it's pretty much different with the VFR flight. Normally the VFR, they don't really care about the clearances, but instrument. Since now you're flying instrument, your life is dependent on the ATC. They have to be fully responsible uh, for the traffic separation since you are flying blindly. Okay. The main difference between flying instrument and um, if you're a private pilot without instrument rating or even commercial pilot without instrument rating and you're flying VFR, you have a fully responsible of your uh, traffic separation. But in instrument, you still have that responsibility if you can, even though you're flying in the IFR mode, right? There's two flight plans. The first is visual flight rules and the other one is instrument flight rules. When you are, uh, when you cannot achieve or you cannot comply with the visual weather minimums, the 91, the 155, I think, then you have to open your IFR flight plan. It means you have to change from the VFR to IFR. So at that time, then you will require instrument rating in your pilot certificate, right? So when you cannot maintain the separation and the VFR weather minimum, it means you cannot conduct the see and avoid method. As a pilot in command, we always want to um, apply our airmanship, which is that the see and avoid. So we have to maintain our awareness, situation awareness, look outside and and be responsible to avoid any traffic or any anything, basically, obstacles. And when you fly blindly inside the clouds uh, in the low visibility, you cannot even see. You barely can see the ground even, right? If you're flying the thick clouds overcast, especially when you're flying the precipitation, as you know, the moderate precipitation, the thickness of the clouds will be like 4,000 feet at least. So when you fly, taking off and then the, the ceiling of the cloud is maybe 1,000 feet AGL. Then when you come to the clouds, you cannot see anything. You cannot see the traffic obstacles. Then the ATC will have the main responsibility for the traffic separation. Of course, they try to manage the traffic for you, separate you from the military, of course, right? and then separate you from the commercial jet, then you have to be very strict on the speed, heading, and altitude. The pilot deviation, we talk about the pilot deviation. Now. As instrument rating pilot, you have to know that uh, they will be really mad um, of any pilots that deviate from their instruction because you will screw the whole airport's traffic circulation. So when they give you altitude, the number one priority, uh, the priority, okay, you have to remember as instrument rating pilot, when you fly instrument, you cannot, uh, you cannot deviate on the altitude. On the heading, the lateral, maybe you can make like several dirty flight. I say that, I say that a dirty flight, but in terms of the altitude, you cannot make a joke with that. So if they appoint a 4,000 and then you deviate like, at, at least you have to maintain uh, 100 feet, minus zero 100 feet, like I said, right? If you fly more than that, 4,200, they will call you directly. Okay, November 6, 393, Charlie, uh, verify your altitude is 4,000. Maybe we maintain 4,000, but the problem is maybe we forgot to change the altimeter settings. Then that becomes a situation. Then we will call you, uh, verify the altimeter setting to 9095 and verify 4,000, okay? That's the first thing. If you still maintain uh, the wrong altitude, they will call you. Descend to 4,000, and then we give you 4,000, and why you fly 4,200? That happened in the United States. So you have to be aware. Uh, we don't want to get that kind of attention from the ATC when you fly, of course, right? So that's um, that internal rating stuff. To become instrument rating, you can take a look to 61, 65, that on the FAR for the FAA. And also the ACS, the Airman Certification Standard. And 6165, you can try to open that. And this is pretty straightforward because a sport pilot, you don't have 
uh, instrument rating. So the minimum is private pilot. So after you get private pilot, I strongly recommend you to jump to the instrument rating. <clears throat> what you need is the 50 hours PIC cross country. That's a minimum, which is the cross country is point A to point B and you fly about a 50 mile straight line distance. So when you accomplish with that, the 50 hours, I can do the 50 hours PIC during your instrument training. So when you come to the instrument program, hopefully you already log at least 25 hours pilot in command cross country, then we can organize the route for the 10 days instrument rating program with the 14 day pilot flight academy. During that period, we will do and uh, we'll do a training all will be under cross country. Okay. And you also need to do a long cross country with me as your authorized flight instructor. We're going to do 250 miles cross country as instrument rating pilot. <clears throat> and what you need is 40 hours under the limit, few limiting device. And when you have a training in the AATD, the training device, approved FAA training device, you can lock 20 hours on the AATD and that will be um, counted for your requiring 40 hours under few limiting device. <clears throat> Okay, and there will be an oral exam, like two and a half hours as well. Also the practical tasks, you will have three approaches, which is one approach will be on the full approach, it means simulate non radar area. So three approaches, one in a precision approach, and then three different approaches. Okay, you cannot do ILS at the same time. So our plan is we will do ILS and then VOR and then localizer approach. One of the approach must be simulate non radar environment. It means you have to conduct the whole full approach, including the procedure turn and coming back. If the airplane has DME, it means you have to do, do DME arc. <clears throat> if you have GPS, WAS, let's say it's GPS Garmin 530, then you have to conduct RNAV approach. All right. Then you also have to demonstrate the partial panel, simulate your lose your vacuum, and still have an, uh, to do some approach with that. It means to, uh, between the three approaches, the examiner may bring you to non-precision approach, and you have to do the partial panel in non-precision approach. And then you have to do the holding. Normally, the holding will be like one holding because the examiner wants you to wants to see whether you can uh, enter the holding with the right entry technique. After you get entry on the, the holding, then that's it. He will ask you to continue the approach. An unusual attitude. <clears throat> he will ask you to head down, and then he will move and yank the airplane, climb, cut the power, and he has to ask you to recover for, from the unusual attitude. It's pretty much straightforward. They don't evaluate your landings, but if you cannot show him or convince him that you can land the airplane safely, he may fail you for that, you know, because landing is not on the failure eight items here. But if you, uh, if you fail to demonstrate that you can land properly, uh, that also be a problem for you, All right? <clears throat> okay, so prefilates as instrument rating pilot related to commercial pilot. As commercial pilot, if you don't have instrument rating, you cannot uh, fly with the commercial pilot privilege, which is a compensation for hire. At day, you cannot fly more than 50 miles from the departure of, uh, from the point of departure, okay? And you cannot fly commercially at night. So that's your limitation. <clears throat> By owning instrument rating, it means you can now fly at class alpha. You can fly more than uh, 18,000 feet. You can fly the bigger airplane now. Maybe you fly the TBM with the private pilot. You fly to flight level 300 with TBM. Now you can do it. There is no uh, restriction on that. So I'm going to talk about the philosophy of flying IFR. Remember, flying instrument, you're flying blind. Okay? And, and uh, you cannot see anything. Flying blindly, you're flying inside the clouds. Number two, since you're flying blind, after you take off, there will be a no. Uh, there will be no turning back. You know what I mean? If you're flying VFR and then something happened or you forgot something, oh, I forget the chart. Oh, I forget this. I forget that. Uh, you always can join the traffic pattern landing back. But if you're flying inside the cloud and suddenly I lost my iPad or 
oh my God, I bring the wrong chart, okay? Then you're in the huge problem. And especially when you climb and you're not prepared and you don't have all the frequencies, you don't even know what the frequencies and you forgot to bring your chart supplement. You don't bring your iPad or you bring your iPad, but your battery all out, right? You cannot turn your iPad because you forgot to charge the battery. Then you're already inside the clouds. There will be a huge problem for you. So flat planning is everything before we talk about flat planning. Since you are flying blindly, because the instrument privilege is you can fly at the low visibility. It doesn't mean that you can fly to the thunderstorm. So it means you're flying the Cessna 172 or you fly the twin Comanche or, or Duchess. <clears throat> and you plan to fly inside to the cell of thunderstorm that you're just killing yourself, right? So it, why we, we need to um, have instrument ready, we, we're going to discuss it later. But the, for the flight planning, you, you need to back to the pace things, okay? As a pilot, remember, <clears throat> the big things of instrument is about the proficiency. We talk about landings. If you're a private pilot, the brand new private pilot, the worst scenario is you forgot how to land the airplane and then you smash the airplane and then what happened? Maybe you, you got a broke tire, right? And the airplane stuck on the runway and you have to call the airport odds to, to uh, tow your airplane out of the runway. That's the worst case of being private pilot who are uh, not proficient enough to land the airplane. But if you're talking about you're not proficient for instrument rating and you fly inside the clouds, what's gonna happen is you may lose your life, okay? Because remember, Flying instrument without any adequate skill or proficiency, this will make you loss of orientation, loss of uh, situation awareness, and finally, spatial disorientation. And after spatial of the disorientation, you cannot fly well on the airplane, uncoordinated flight, what's gonna happen? Spin. Spin, and you die. Okay, a lot of people die, like John uh, JFK Jr. What happened with him? Fly the Piper Dakota, I believe, right? And then uh, from the VFR, turn the IFR, and he 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 used to be in the training of instrument, but he never finished that. Then he got trapped on adverse weather, and he tried to fly inside the clouds, and boom, spatial disorientation, died with the two friends. This, another one is sisters, I believe. So. That's the thing of instrument. You have to be sure that I'm proficient enough. So if you are not proficient enough, just take anyone else as a safety pilot and you keep doing the practice on your instrument things. No matter you already lock like 2000 hours instrument or 4000, 4000 hours instrument, it doesn't matter. If you're not flying for the like three months, four months in a row, you're not flying under the fuel limiting device, you're not proficient enough. Flying under fuel limiting device and flying under the real IMC is also different. So just make sure that you bring your instructor or bring your any senior friends uh, before you try to practice on the IMC. When you fly inside the clouds, right? Everything is white. You cannot see anything, just white. That's on the cloud. Another thing is when you're flying under precipitation, there will be a nervous sensing, a lot of like weird noise because the rain. Now you cannot see anything. You got turbulence or maybe the freezing cold there. Then that will be a huge challenge. <clears throat> so make sure the pilot currency and proficiency is good. And then your airplanes. A lot of people die because they don't realize their airplane is not certified for the icing. Like the 172, they don't have uh, that airplane, only have what? Carburetor heat and pitot heat, right? Pitot heat is anti-ice. Carburetor heat actually is like the icing, but it's not completely the icing. What you're talking about the icing is you don't have boot. You don't have like windshield protection. If I fly the citation, I have the boot. When my wing got a ram ice, what gonna happen? I will just cycle the boot and uh, inflate the boot, right? And crack all the ice. <clears throat> Short story, this airplane is not for icing. 
So you have to be aware that you cannot fly inside the cloud when the temperature is near to the freezing level or between the plus five to minus 10 because that will be a clear ice area. So if you flying into the feasible moisture with that temperature, you just kill yourself because you don't know that your airplane is not certified for icing. The other one is, <clears throat> since we know that when we fly instrument, we are flying to the brand new level of strategy. When you depart, some airports require you to depart with standard instrument departure. And some standard instrument departure for the airport that has a high obstacles around the airport, it wants you to fly on a very high climb rate. While the weather is hot, you cannot achieve the climb rate and you don't even know what is my minimum takeoff climb rate for that specific SID, right? Especially when you fly the multi-engine, then you got the single engine problems. You take off hot weather, maximum takeoff weight, and there's obstacle there. Then suddenly after takeoff, you got a one engine fail. What can happen? You have to still maintain one engine gradient, which is that 1.5% gradient. Okay, you have to maintain that, and then maybe more is depend on the SID. And how if your airplane cannot achieve that SID minimum takeoff climb rate, and you never read it, you don't even know about that. And when the problems happen, you cannot do anything. You're just praying, hopefully my plane will not get hit by any antennas or trees or anything. So you have to really aware because when you're taking off with instrument, you cannot see anything. Just put that into your consideration. And firemen, you have to know whether you familiar with the area. A lot of pilot loss of their situation awareness because they don't really familiar with the area. I always teach my students to combine both visual and instrument, which is if you fly to a place that you never fly to there before, make sure that you bring your sectional chart, make sure you know that, okay, this area, I know roughly uh, the airport is on my north side or south side. And then between this area, between this VOR, I know I've been there before. I saw the trees, the big antennas or mountain or anything. Okay, just to make sure when you fly in the IMC to any place that you've never been there before, don't fly alone. Don't fly alone. Always bring your friend because you are not flying for like commercial operation now. You're a private pilot or you're a commercial pilot, then you get your private, you got your instrument rating, but you are not flying for uh, operator that requires you to fly in any weather, any situation, any destination. You always can delay or pending the flight. Okay, that's the philosophy that you really need to understand. The external pressure. When you fly instrument is same like the other flight, like visual, uh, sometimes we always in rush. Okay. Uh, we think that, all right, let's jump to the airplane, let's fly first, and then we can prepare all the charts on board. Never, ever do that. So let's say your departure is 12 o'clock, okay? And you know that you're going to fly like two hours. Just make sure that you start working on your paperwork like 7 a.m., maybe like five hours before. You learn every single thing about your instrument flight, like how to depart from this airport, right? What is my SID, standard instrument departure? What is my ODP, obstacle departure procedures? Whether I, can I, can my airplane fly with these procedures? If yes, all right, so what is my frequencies? After I take off, right, uh, which direction I have to turn and how to intercept this radial, that radial and everything. Do the chair flying during the end route. You have to know uh, when is my where is my VOR change over point? You know, the COP, at the point that we have to change to the next VOR station, and how many DME per segment, how I identify one fix to another fix. You have to know that before even flying, before, ever, before even entering the airplane. So that extra pressure, a lot of people just skip that. Okay, jump to the airplane because I have GPS, I have iPad, then it doesn't matter for me, just take it. And if something happened, I can just ask for the factor. That's really bad habit of instrument graded pilot. They just lazy and they risk their life on that. So that's a flight planning is really terrible because instrument flight, you deal with the bad weather. Okay. So there are a level of instrument rating. 
private to private or commercial or ATP level of instrument because this is like a wide area of things of uh, the skills. Okay, you are not learning about RNAS now. You are not learning about let's say um, ILS PRM like parallel LS or category one, two, three, the examiner will not ask you about that because this is not a this is not a portion for like commercial pilot standard or even um, private pilot standard. That's on the ATP level of uh, instrument rating. So we're gonna do, use this Airman certification standard to June, make sure you use the newest one and all the knowledge part <clears throat> the weather information, cross-country flight planning, how to use all the resources to conduct all the cross-country and make your cross-country safe. <clears throat> the system, okay? You really have to understand uh, the pedostatic instrument system like altimeter, airspeed indicator, vertical speed indicator, and then the gyroscopic. You already learned that in the private pilot, but on the instrument, I need you to be very precise on that, how it works, and if that fail, and how to anticipate, especially on the emergency system uh, procedures. How the VOR DME ILS works. Since our airplane, you don't have uh, RNAV on your plane, so we don't have to talk about RNAV on this stage. Airworthiness, and then how to comply with the ATC clearances, how to depart from um, non control area, like non tower airport. How how can you obtain the ATC clearance, right? So the knowledge is pretty much straightforward. Uh, it's not really hard. And the last comp procedures is a huge thing of the instrument rating FAA check, right? The examiner will give you a scenario base. Okay, you fly on uh, this standard terminal arrival, okay? Then you have a fail of your last comp. You, you got a last comp at this point. What are you going to do? What is the procedures? The ATC gives you descent via, let's say, the star name, okay? Descent via link 8 arrival. And then suddenly after the ATC is saying that, you got a lost comp. And you have to ex tell the examiner what exactly you're going to do. So that's the scenario base of uh, instrument. Okay, more on the lost comp. So the last com is the fail item on the oral exam. A lot of people fail in the last com. So we're going to train you a lot of that kind of stuff. So deal with emergency. There are several emergency that you have to know. The first is the thunderstorm, the adverse weather. As you know that why we take instrument rating, because we want to fly at uh, unfavorable weather, OK? But the biggest enemy of instrument rated pilot is ice. If you're visual flight rules pilot, you, can, you cannot fly to IMC weather. What is IMC? Meteorological condition, right? You cannot fly to that area. But now your instrument rating pilot, you can fly under IMC, but your biggest enemy now is icing. Remember on that. So the thunderstorm is also the huge problem for any pilots, not only the small airplane pilots, even the jets. <clears> then <throat> we have to know how to deal with the thunderstorm later, right? If you get trapped in the thunderstorm, never turning back. Because near the thunderstorm, you will get a turbulence. When you turn, I mean the turbulence, what's going to happen? You will get a what? load factor, more load factor and, and give you structural damage. So just fly straight to that thunderstorm, but make sure you know where's the cell, right? If you're looking to the, any resources for the FAA seminars, AOPA, <clears throat> there will be no suggestion for you to turn back. When you penetrate the thunderstorm, make sure you're not flying into the core, into the cells, okay? You're flying under your VA, your turbulence penetration speed. Maintain your attitude because that's a very important part. And turn on your cockpit lights at the highest intensity because there should be a lighting. And I went there before one time. I told you I, I got a lot of lightings around me, right? So I turn on the lights. 
because that will uh, give you a lot of troubles on your visual when you got a wide lighting. And any emergency, like a system emergency, uh, you got a pedostatic fail blocked by the ice, then you'll start losing the flight instruments. You lose your electrical, you lose your turn coordinator, you lost your comm, you got uh, precipitation static, electrical static. So make sure at, when you do a pre-flight for the IFR, you know your static discharge, okay, is there. Then that will help you to reduce that. <clears throat> All right, so why we have to have instrument ready if we always need to avoid the bad weather? So what's the point? So like I said, if you're not flying the 121 on 135, Owning instrument rating is like an insurance for you. It's like an insurance. It means that uh, we, we never want to fly under IMC. That's the truth. There's only fool people when they say that, oh, wow, thanks God, now it's IMC. Heavy rain, let's fly. Let's try our brand new instrument rating certificate. That's a fool people. You are just a damn idiot with that, right? Nobody's going to fly with the low visibility and fly like that. No. But so why we have instrument rating, if you're flying on, on the airline or you're flying as a charter jet, then your boss calling you 2 a.m. in the midnight when you have a low IFR. Hey, dude, get prepared. In the next two hours, we're going to fly from Van Nuys to London. See, you only have like two hours. Then when you check the four flight, you find that the weather now is low IFR. The ceiling is less than 500. Can you... Call back your boss, boss, I'm sorry. Now the weather is IFR, so sorry. It's better for us to wait until the next five hours. You know what? Tomorrow you get fired. Right? So I'm hiring you. I'm paying you like $50,000 a month, and you call me to delay my flight. I have a business there. What kind of pilot you are, right? So that's a problem. I mean, if you're under Part 91, then... The problem is you always, you don't have any problem. I mean, you, you, you can always uh, delay the flight. But if you're flying under the 121, 125, there will be huge external pressure. You know what I mean? Like the pace, the external pressure is one, once you fly for anybody who hire you as commercial pilot, then you have to think about that. Let's say you are a captain for Scoot Air. You're going to back to Singapore and fly for, hopefully, you get a Silk Air job or Scoot Air. Then you feel unwell. Then you think that, all right, it's fine, let's fly. As a captain, you are not feeling well. You are not proficient to the airport that you've never been there before. Like, no, it's not going gonna, not gonna to possible. I mean, if you're already at the airline, you, you when you go to any destination as pilot in command, you already have like a route check before, especially when the airport is not easy, a lot of obstacle high elevation. But maybe the last time you flew there was like two months ago and you never been there after. Then suddenly with your like weak condition because you're sick, then you take that job, you fly to that airport and then suddenly you get trapped in the low IFR. Now the external pressure will be your huge obstacle of life is not good anymore, right? So that's the thing you have to consider. Now, instrument rating, we are no longer thinking what next, but we're always thinking about what's the next in what's the next two steps ahead, three steps ahead. We are not talking about what next in the next step. We are talking about the three, four steps ahead. Even though you're already considering about whether you can land to your destination or you have to take the alternate before even you enter the airplane. So instrument rating is about preparation, flood planning. Okay. <clears throat> the fundamental of flying IFR, instrument cross-check, interpretation, and aircraft control. Say it. Instrument cross-check. Control. Yes. So this is the fundamental of IFR. 
you always cross-checking your flight instrument, your engine instrument, your navigation instrument. We're gonna we're gonna cross-check each instrument every two seconds. Now your eyes will never stop on single instrument. We always move every two seconds. Every two seconds. I got uh, another Singapore student that time. His main weaknesses is, you know what, fixation. And I have to keep using like a magic spell. You still remember him, right? So like attitude, heading, VSI, attitude, airspeed, heading. So every two seconds, because when I, when I stop doing that, you know, his eyes just suck to airspeed or heading. So then the airplane is starting to roll and climb and whatever until it's a huge thing for the flight instructor to remind you to scan and do the cross check of your flight instrument. So that's instrument cross check things. And interpretation, this is when the situation awareness comes. If you don't really understand about the systems, right? If you don't really understand about how the compass will give you a pilot, uh, the compass dip error, give you like turning error, of course, acceleration, deceleration error, and you fly under IMC. When you accelerate, so you know the accelerate and decelerate error, right? When you accelerate, the compass will turn slightly to the north. So when you apply the power, you're flying under the clouds. You cannot see, you don't have like visual horizon. Then you add the power, then the compass will turn to the north. What's the first sensing of your brain? You maybe turn, right? And you cannot see outside anyway. And what can happen if you think that you're turning to the, let's say you're turning left to the north, then you, you will do a correction to the right. At that time, the airplane is never moving. It's just because you never understand exactly what is the compass doing because there's an instrument interpretation skill that you need to uh, prepare before you're flying under the clouds, all right? So that inter instrument interpretation, and then if you like, um, what else? You have disagreement between your airspeed and your attitude indicator. Your attitude indicator is not moving, it's just showing a level, it's not even turning. You have maximum power because your tachometer, your RPM showing you're flying the 2300 RPM, but your airspeed is reducing, gradually reduce. What happened? What is the possible things to happen? <coughs> yeah, then you have to check. No, with the heading indicator first. Because that the partial panel, the vacuum fail, right? You lose your two uh, instruments. And then what you're going to check is comparing the airspeed and the altimeter and then the VSI. That's the interpretation because you know it doesn't make sense. I lost my speed and I'm not even climbing. So you have to keep scanning. You think that, okay, that's easy. Yes, because you're sitting there. But if you're in the airplane, you're flying under the clouds, right? Nighttime, alone. If that happened, you're already busy with anything. So that's a core fundamental you have to know. And then aircraft control. Whatever happened when you fly alone, you fly as a pilot in command with your friend, whatever happened. Remember, aviate, navigate, communicate. Fly the damn airplane first. Okay, don't worry about anything else. Just fly the airplane straight and level. You are not turning to the left, you're not turning to the right, you're not climbing, you're not descending. Fly the airplane, calm down and think. All right, and do the scanning and always bring your POH. You know exactly where's my emergency position. Flying inside the cloud is different ball game. Okay, you have to really know if I got electrical failure what I have to do. If I got um, 
instrument failures, what I have to do. When I got fires inside the cloud, what I have to do. You're right? We're going to fly later inside the clouds. I'll take you fly for a short period of real IMC because I think you need that as well. Okay. And I will show you how the difference between flying under the fuel limiting device and flying in the real IMC. <clears throat> okay, so do not trust your body. Your body is always lie because your inner ear, right? Lead you to spatial disorientation. So flying IFR, the pace of IFR flying, you got departure, you got en route, and you got arrival. That's the main thing you have to know that. Let's say you're here, your beautiful day, airport, long runway or anything. Okay. It's uh, the 8,000 feet runway. Now you're gonna fly to a place. There are two airport. The first is short runway and high elevation, no tower, no AIAP. Okay, so what is the difference between the IA, uh, the lesion of the airport, whether the airport has no instrument approach procedures? Do you know the color? When you see the chart, the airport is like this, right? And there are two, three colors, green, brown and blue. blue, and brown. So what's the difference? Brown is without IAP. Yes. And then green and blue? Military. Military, green is civilian. Excellent. I love it. And the other thing is um, it's the normal airport with the ILS or with VOR or whatever. Right? So now you're flying to that airport, departing from here, taking off. And there's a freeway on the sky. This is a freeway, okay? And the freeway name is Victor 186. There's a, another name, what else? No, let's say this is a Victor Airways. Is there any airways that we know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Q. Could be Q or T, right? This is for the GPS, RNAV approach, uh, sorry, RNAV and root area. What else? The J? Okay. So this is what we call end root structure. This is what we call the departure structure. And now you're flying to this airport, you got to descend, of course. You have to descend here. Then at this point, we call that arrival structure. Isn't it? <clears throat> so when you are at arrival structure, there will be another problems here. We call that misapproach structure. So this all about instrument rating. I divided the pace of the flight through the four paces. The first is departure, end route, arrival, and misapproach. And the arrival, there will be a two things. How to join the approach. How to shoot the approach. There are two things on the arrival structure. An instrument, there are two types of 
the root or anything, altitude, so there will be a low and high, right? And this also the part that you are not going to learn about at this stage because you are not at ATP level. The examiner will not ask you about the high level of um, the root. This is the high level. You see, this is the J root, the same place. Okay, this is a Camario VOR Oxnard area. And this chart is the um, high altitude. You can see the J root there, right? Uh, I'm going to move to the um, low. Then it's different. This Victor Airways is two different games. So the high root is about the 18,000 feet and above, right? 24,000. All right, let's take a look to this board. This is all the regulations, procedures that you have to uh, study. That's why I divide this into several parts of structures, make it easier. How to depart, right? How to leave, how to fly from this airport to join this airway. Now you got a cloud here. Can you fly and clear and fly and navigate when you have a lot of clouds here? Let's say it's a low visibility. How to bring you from this airport to this root structure? So we got SID, we got ODP, we got diverse factor area, we got radar factor, okay? The radar factor is, of course, under DVA, diverse factor area. After we join this, you have to know how to fly to one destination to another destination. Let's say from Oxnard, we're gonna fly to L52, right? It's all about flat planning. Remember that. Clear. Okay, let's take a look. You're from Oxnard. And then you're gonna fly to that way, let's say to Oziano. Oziano is the airport without instrument approach procedures. Then you have to fly from Oxnard, let's say this is Oxnard, and this is L52. You fly to this, from this point, join the air structures, land there. That is your flight plan on your oral exam. Why examiner give you this? Because he wants to know whether you know how to fly to the airport without instrument approach procedures, IMC. And what is regu regulation apply for that? So you're flying um, from Oxnard. You take this route, right? What's the route name, Victor? Why don't you take the Tango 257? The low altitude GPS. So we're not going to use the blue one. We're going to use the black one. And what's the number is this? What is that? Altitude. What's gu what is guarantee you? Guarantee is clearance from obstacle and navigational signal. For how many miles? Four nautical miles. Excellent. Five. So if you're flying this and you take a look, the radial is 289. Okay. So that will be your course bearing 289 over there. Then you fly that to until this intersection call. Diano, 
The thing is how you identify whether you reach the unknown. So at this point, we're going to talk at this part first. So this is the unknown. That's your first fix. How to bring you from Oxnard to the unknown? Can you just take off and join this? Maybe. It depends whether you have SID or you have a weather factor. So let's open Oxnard. The plate of Oxnard. We have two departure procedures. You have uh, Camario 6 and Skiff 7. Let's open Camario 6. Okay. So is this applicable for our flight? This is about choosing your departure procedure. Is this applicable? No, because this SID will taking you to Van Nuys or to Villmore. This is a transition. This is a transition, transition, transition. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, this string and back turn. So it's, not it's not applicable. This is for any destination from Vilmar transition to any destination to join, right? So this is the function of SID. This is how to bring you from this airport to join this airway. But this is not your SID because this, not, this SID is not going to bring you to the Victor 25. Make sense? So let's take a look to another plate then. Let's try skip seven. How about this? So this is Oxnard. So is this the airport, uh, the SID that related to your flight? Yeah. So takeoff minimum runway seven or two five. So if two five, standard except crane transition. So there's a uh, two items here. This is the graph and this is the text. All right. And if the the SID has like two items together, we call that a hybrid mode. Runway 25, climb to 6,000 or assigned altitude or Camario radial 249 to cross skiff intersection at or above 600, dance on the transition or assigned route. So where's the transition? There's a squid, quang. Go left. Okay. So you're coming, for, you're, you're going to skip. So skip is the first fix for this SID. That's why they call that um, a skip departure. Okay. You're coming from Camario, you fly to skip. Then from skip is up to you. You want to quang or you want to uh, squid? Okay. So which one? Yes, why Quang? Because it's a uh, piano is just below Quang. Yeah. Okay. So look, when you fly from Oxnard, you want Victor 25, right? But your SID gives you Quang. So which one you have to follow? You see that? They give you coin and 15 miles and uh, they give you a limitation for the altitude, the 6,000. So 282 and then from this point, go to San Marcos. The question is, from Quang to San Marcos, there will be no road. This is not a road. This is just a radial information because there is no MEA. You cannot fly this, right? So let's back to this. We know that the SID will give you 282 because this 282 is also uh, the feeder route. It's not the feeder route because there is no minimums and distance. Okay. So when you fly, 
from Oxnard, they give you a skiff departure, bring you to Huang, and then from Huang, Could be uh, San Marcos. Or join the Victor 125. So from Quang, this could be intercept the Victor 25 and you proceed. That's how we choose the route, right? And the other things is, you can always use the chart supplement. We have a tech root. What is tech root? Tower and root control. So in states, there are several airports here. You don't have to fill the flat plans. The tower and tower will have a coordination for you. And they have a specific route for you over here. Can you take a look at this? So let's say it's here from Oxnard to Santa Barbara or to Burbank. This is the root ID and this is the root Camarillo radial 72. So if this only quang, quang intersection and correct, they will give you a better factor. So it means based on the tech route, okay, if you're flying from Oxnard to Santa Barbara, they will give you Quang based on the SID, of course, because the SID will have a skiff departure, or they give you a radar factor departure, maintain run, fly runway hiding, and expect uh, any lateral instruction from them. But if you're using skiff, so from Quang, the next will be radar factor. Quang direct. Quang intercept Victor 25, RZS, and boom. So this is the way how we think about choosing the flight, uh, choosing the um, airway, the route, SID, and a lot of consideration that we're going to discuss it later. <clears throat> so now you're flying to L52, Santa Maria. Okay, go XR. Yep. All right, so this is Diano San Marcos. You see this L52 is over here. As you can see, this is the airway, Victor 27. And the airport is never be exactly on the airway. Whether the airport is just beside of the airway, then there's no VOR on this area. The VOR is um, Morro Bay, but it's several miles from L52, right? It's like eight miles. How from this area you go down to L52? There's no instrument approach procedures. The examiner will ask you how to descend from your MEA. Can you descend from the MEA? Yes, if VFR, excellent. Otherwise you cannot descend, right? Or if you reach the initial approach fix, then you can descend, but L52, you don't have it. You don't have any, uh, you don't have instrument approach procedures. Then how can you go there? The only way is greater factor to leave 
from this point, descend, they will tell you, fly this heading, descend to this altitude, because you're under radar factor. Any altitude that given to you by the, by the ATC, when you out of the airway, what we call that minimum factor altitude, MPA. All right? They give you fly this heading, descend to uh, any altitude, let's say descend to 5,000 feet, descend to 3,000 feet, report when the airport inside. You see the airport inside, then you call uh, SoCal November 6th, 2003, Charlie, we have L52 inside, request feasible approach. Then the feasible approach means you are still under instrument flight rules, but you are using feasible approach. And a visual approach is request by the pilot when you're confident you can land with a visual reference. Or when you see the airport, I can just say SoCal approach November 16 energy, Charlie, cancel IFR, and we have airport inside. All right? So life is good. And they will say November 16 energy, IFR cancellation received, squat VFR, altimeter setting 29095. Have a good day. And then from that point, IFR changed to VFR. Then you land to L52. There's no star, there's no anything. Any question? This is a feeder route because there's an arrow, there's MEA, there's a destination, uh, there's a um, distance. But this is not. This is a cross radial indicator. There's nothing here. So you cannot fly this line. The examiner will ask you, can you fly this? The answer is, no, why? This is not feeder road. So what, what's differentiate between this line and the feeder road? MEA. Is there any MEA there? No. And the distance. So let's take a look to this. You have MEA, you have distance. Um, let's get skip. All right. <clears throat> now, how about this? When you fly from Oxnard here, then you're going to fly to Squid intersection. Do we have MEA here? Yeah, you got 2,000. So this is your feeder route. Take off runway seven, uh, I want quit or quang from skiff intersection via VTU R22, uh, R282 to quang. So is this feeder route? How do we know? Yep. And? And you got 6,000. Climb to 6,000 or resign altitude on Camarillo 249 to cross skip intersection at or above 600. So this will be 600. There will be, um, so if there's a limitation this is a restriction. We call this a restriction because at skiff you have to at least get 600 feet. Then your climb rate will be steeper. What is the minimum climb rate of IFR? 200 feet per nautical mile. And how to convert that to VSI? 200 times the ground speed divided by 60. 
So IFR climb rate Do you have a marker? Two hundred times ground speed divided by sixty. That's how to convert from vertical feet per minute, feet per nautical mile to FEM. That's the standard. You see here, standard except quang transition. Quang, quang transition. Okay, standard takeoff minimum is standard except quang transition requires a minimum climb of 370 feet per nautical mile to 600. So you see that? So always read the notes here. And you got top altitude. I will explain about the SID later. There's a top altitude, there's a altitude restriction, or there's nothing. Okay? Then the clearances, the word, the wording are different. So now you got a top altitude. Normally, they will give you only like direction because you know already the top altitude is 6,000. So this could be like uh, November 6, 303, Charlie, you clear to Oceano via Skiff 7 departure. Okay. Climb and maintain 6,000. Only that. Because you, you got a top altitude. But to do the quang, since there's a limitation here, this bottom underline, it means that you have to maintain, uh, you have to be above, at or above 600 feet at skiff. So standard rate will be 370. Calculate this. Your true airspeed, uh, you, sorry, your ground speed will be maybe 85. Divide by 60. Then what is your VSI? for uh, vertical speed, <clears throat> feet per minute. Say again? 370. Three, seven, Here, 370 times 85, divided by 60. Five? five. So you have to maintain at least five to four. You cannot slide 500 feet per minute. So if I become you, I will aim like six to 700 per minute. Now, the problem is whether your airplane can comply with the five, more than 500 feet per minute. How about if that hot, high elevation, single engine, you, you fly with the twin and you got an engine failure, you read the performance, whether I can comply with the 370 feet per nautical mile. Make sense now? So that's how to bring you to Quang intersection. And from Quang, this could be a uh, brighter factor. That's for departure. For arrival, it's same. You don't have, uh, because you don't have any standard terminal arrival, <clears throat> then this could be brighter factor. From this point, to leaving the MEA and you go down. Now, how to join the approach is using the star. Later we discuss about how to use the star. If there's SID, then there will be a star, right? How to shoot the approach is another case that you have to show the examiner. You have to really good at all of, um... yeah, let's say this. Every single legend, you have to know exactly. Memorize all the legend, understand every single thing, and know, make sure you know how to fly. And this is all the notes. The most important part, you know, where is your um, vinyl approach fix? Where's your mix, uh, misapproach? Your MDA, your time, 
all the frequencies. This is my notes on my uh, CF double I check, right? Is that on the email, Joe? Uh, the PowerPoint? Oh, yeah. All right, the last part is common errors. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a break for a while. Okay, the last part of this session is the common errors. There are several common errors for instrument flying. Normally, student or any pilot, actually. The first is fixation. You just stuck to any any uh, you just stuck to single instrument, and you want to make a perfection. Then you think that the more you stare at that instrument, the better. But I can say that it's wrong. Okay, that's totally wrong. 
you have to keep moving every two seconds, every two seconds, you keep moving. Then finally, you can do the three fundamentals of instrument line. You cannot do instrument check if you just fixate on single instrument. Number two is overcorrection of the airplane for intercepting an approach. That's common. A lot of people try to intercept ILS with the two hands and like driving a car. It doesn't work like that. Okay. Then on the plane, I will uh, teach you later how to minimize these problems. But at least as a new student of instrument, you have to know this will be your problems. Unstable power setting and unfamiliar with the pitch strategy. We have to fly with the pitch and leave the power there. So let's say so when you are shooting the approach, set the power to 1900 to 2000 RPM and play around with the pitch. Unstable, uh, okay, VOR approach in single engine propeller, forgot to retract landing gear on step down approach. You are not flying the multi engine, so, but later you're gonna fly single multi engine. Remember, forget to retract landing gear when you do a step down approach like this and you have a single engine. Overload and stress for task management. This is normal. A lot of people get an overload, but the more hours you fly, you'll be better. And remember, my strategy is you do over and over and over again the approaches that you're going to do for the check ride. When you remember, when you memorize it, then that will be your second nature. When you're at the second nature state, it's easier for you. Like you're driving a car. When you first time learn driving a car, it's same exactly. So use our simulator, right? No matter you spend 20 hours in this building, you can sleep in this class. Just do over and over and over again, the same approaches, same radios, Okay, we have Pilot Edge. Uh, we're really grateful that there's there's a Pilot Edge organization that can help you to reduce your stress. And wrong holding, turning, and interpretation, and this will be a fail items. The holding, standard holding should be turned to the right. And some people turn to the left because they're nervous. Holding entry, teardrop, parallel, direct entry. They forgot how to do that. It, that is also the fail items. The wrong final course setting, also um, fail items. Wrong frequency for approach. All right, this fail items. That's why every time you change the frequency, you want to item. Listen to Morse code. It's always change frequency, item. Change frequency, item. Change frequency, set another frequency. Change frequency, idem. Descend below MDA without corrective action. It's totally fail. The MDA is, let's say MDA is 1,500, and you're descend below that without even realize that. And the examiner will say, no, 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 that's a fail item. There is no second chance. So always remember when you fly the MDA plus hundreds. Let's say the MDA is 1,500. Fly to 1600. Okay, because minus zero plus 100. CDI and GPS button problems that happened to Randy. He failed his, his um, multi engine because he put the wrong procedures, load the wrong procedures. Also, sometimes the CDI and GPS button, you got confused, mixed up. Then you track the GPS. Uh, indicator instead of tracking your CDI from the VOR. Wrong approach loading in GPS. Late to intercept final approach scores. So the final approach scores is like this, and you keep doing this, we don't even realize that. That's a fail item. Forgot to time the approach. That's not a fail item, but the examiner will give you a debrief on that. So when you at non-precision approach and you are leaving FAF, how to identify your misapproach point? There will be a DME, there will be a cross radial or time. So whenever you leave the final approach fix, time your approach. Loss orientation, that's also failed. That's why there will be a diversion. 
you will get a diversion uh, test. Always have your situation awareness, no matter where you go. And forget to note take off time, that also a will items. When you get a clear for takeoff, note the time. All right, so that's all about the introduction of IFR and at least a head up, what you're gonna have to prepare and what is the fail items on your flight, okay? Then we're gonna have a break and we continue for the next materials. Hopefully you can uh, have a good recap, uh, recap on these materials, okay? So long story short, Instrument rating is about more preparation, more flight planning, fly better and safer. <coughs> All right. Okay, we're gonna have a break and see you on the next videos. Thank you for joining for the India Pilot Flight Academy, guys. And subscribe, share to your friend who's gonna take instrument rating program with us. Hopefully, we can fly with you. Enjoy um, at the uh, beautiful Los Angeles area. So see you next time. Yeah. Mm-hmm.